Okay. Yes, that's the organizer who will get the. Do we need to write down this? No, no. Okay. We get an email afterwards. Ah, okay. great. Nice. Now we are recording. Now we are recording. Is it just the screen or is it us as well? Mm, not sure. It not sure. Enough. Oh, wait. Is it tracking me? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It gets automatically glued at the end. Ah, nice. So, anyhow, uh, welcome to the first big one of the Rust Zurich meetup. Let me give you a little bit of history. So we started out as a sub uh, meetup of the Mozilla meetup in uh, Zurich and Bern. And then over time we noticed that there was a lot of Rust content we wanted to do. And Mozilla wanted to go in a different time. This was also when their uh, HomeKit uh, alternative started. You know, the, the self-hosted home automation thingy. And yeah, it just grew and grew. And then uh, in 2017, we organized Rust Fest in Zurich. Uh, it was up on the hill at ETH. I'm very happy that Sebastian's still here, helped organize. Rafael is here as well, somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the main struggle in the beginning was, what is Rust? Why should we use it? How can I do this and that use case? And over time, that changed into look at this neat solution and look at this little story that I found. And the project became less of this was the monolith I had to build to solve some minor problem towards, oh, now I can use this and that library and just build something out of components. So to reflect that, I would like you or anyone that's watching the stream later to send us a, an email, a message or something and tell us, hey, I have made this little experience. It took us, I don't know, a week or a weekend. And it's just this little neat thing. And then we have five minutes or something like that where people can just tell everyone else that's how I did it. And it doesn't even matter if it's the same as the one presenting next to it. Because it would be really funny when like five people in a row were like, yeah, we had the same problem and we solved it the same. <laughs> that would be a nice pattern. But also nice to know if they solved it completely differently. And the time for that would be probably in March or at any of the other meetups. So... And this is the part where people are like, oh, yeah, this is what I actually care about, the next meetups. We are currently a little bit understaffed, so we can't do one in uh, January. Martin, can you move? Oh, do you want him to hide? <laughs> By the way, it's just finished compiling, and now it's uploading. So, And it's restarted. <laughs> we'll see if that fixed it. Yes, the Definity Meetup is the. So, Definity is a company. They do uh, web stuff. <laughs> we are currently looking at the 7th of February, where we have uh, two talks. One will be uh, my master thesis, and one will be some, something else. Unless we find another cool talk for February, then I will just move mine to March. And March is currently the idea that we have a big one and a couple small ones. And April, we don't know. We also uh, take big talks. So, any questions so far? Always at the beginning of the month. No, that's coincidence. <laughs> it's rather random. We try to aim for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Because just Friday and Monday are usually loaded with other stuff. Yes. Oh, if you want to host an event, then uh, please approach me or uh, <coughs> Gary as well. He's over there. Yes. Any more questions? I think we are complete again, right? I see Jonas is back. That's good. Okay. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, everybody. It's amazing to see this room being filled, I think, to capacity. Uh, awesome turnout. Thanks a lot for coming, and uh, welcome to Google. 
I hope everybody got their batches now. So apart from that little uh, complicated start now, we can actually get to the, to the good stuff. Um, I'm just here to introduce you briefly to, so my name is Martin, I work in Android security. I'm going to talk about that in a slide. You've already met Jonas if you needed to print a batch, the gentleman with the hat in the back. Um, but we also have a lot of other Googlers here who work on Rust in different places. So we're going to talk with here from Shane and Manish later in the talks. But we also have people like uh, Robert and Robin down in the back who also work in the same team as Shane and Manish. Um, and there are people in my team that work with, uh, with Rust as well. So just some overview of how Google is involved with Rust. Um, Google tries to you know, use and support Rust in a few different ways. Um, first of all, Google is part of the Rust Foundation. So Google tried to support the you know, long-term development of the language, make sure it has the resources and um, yeah, infrastructure to do that in the long term. But then also something like that I don't see come up very often, but is that Android is uh, using Rust. So Android is at its core a Linux distribution that is shaped so that you can put it on a laptop that looks like a cell phone. Like your cell phones is running a Linux distribution, basically, and that distribution has a whole lot of demons, a whole lot of software running below the application layer. And that platform is using Rust, and that's been going on since 2021. Um, I guess the slide deck will go up somewhere afterwards. You can click on all the links and uh, find these blog posts. Um, we also have a thing called Fuchsia, that is an operating system that uses a not Rust kernel, but it has a user space that is written in Rust. And Fuchsia is running on embedded devices such as some smart displays, uh, Nest devices. Um, so if you've seen that around, they are using an operating system running in Rust right now. And that was an on the over the air update even, which I find quite impressive and I would be quite scared about doing that myself, like take millions of devices, update them from one operating system to a completely new one in a different language over the air. And other things like Chrome OS, like the thing that's inside Chromebooks and uh, is also using Rust. And then we have internationalization libraries, which is then the topic for tonight. Um, just a little bit about Rust and Android, because that's my team, that's where I sit. Uh, I work as part of Android security, and our goal is basically to make Android more secure, make it crashless, make it has, have a few security vulnerabilities. And one of the tools that we do uh, that we use for that is Rust. So we're trying to get rid of memory unsafe languages like C++, C and C++, and replace them with Rust where we see that there are security vulnerabilities. And there's a whole bunch of things in Android today that is using Rust. So Zoom is the build system for Android. It's this big thing that can build all of Android. Um, that has been updated to support Rust, so it knows how to support build Rust binaries and libraries and tests and fussing. And there's a whole lot of build rules in, as part of that. Um, there's a link here to a blog post that was recently put out, maybe two months ago, that the latest versions of Android will have DNS over HTTP3 written in Rust, so that it gives you DNS lookups that are um, authenticated and um, you know confirmed, that has all of the normal TLS security on top of them. And then there's some other components. So there's something called Keystore 2 that stores your cryptographic keys. There's something called Auto Band. Uh, I'm involved in writing the, or helping the Bluetooth people, the Bluetooth team rewrite parts of the Bluetooth stack in Rust as well to make that thing more stable, more secure, and so on. And there's a virtualization framework as well where Android is inside your phone. There are virtual machines running and they are using Rust code to make that safe and secure. Um, yeah. Now, this is from a blog post, um, it's also linked here, that was put out just last week where Android 13, which is the release from, that was just put out this year, that is the first release where more than half of the code that is, half of the new code in that release is written in a memory safe language. Um, it is the blue thing here is Rust, then this is Java, and then we have Kotlin down here. So this part of the pie chart is the memory safe languages. And this is something we are very happy about because it means that we, hope to have fewer vulnerabilities being found in the next months and fewer crashes and all that stuff. Um, what you see on the graph over here is the amount of new memory unsafe code, the blue, well, this is probably been read in some sense, but the blue ones are going down over the years where we have different Android releases and we include less and less memory unsafe code. And the red bars here are then the memory safety vulnerabilities. Um, bits have gone down proportionally. And this kind of track record is very interesting to us because this, this indicates to us that this investment into Rust actually makes our phone safer and 
This is why Google wants to have more Rust in Android. Yeah. Um, questions about this before we start the talk? If not, then this is the program for today. So introduction took some amount of time. Now we're going to have a talk by Shane. We're going to have a break. We're going to have a talk by Manish. And then we have time for socializing until, um, I don't know if anybody will come and uh, send us home, but uh, we have some time at the end of that. Um, you saw Jonas, if you need any help or contact me, contact any of the people with Google badges and we will try to help you if there's any questions or anything. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much. And then I'll give it over to Shane. I guess you will connect or somehow. I've got it. We get this out of the way. Great. Uh, I don't think I'll be needing that computer. Nope. Let's put that somewhere. Okay, then I'm going to take over the screen share. And there we go. Those are my slides. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for, for coming. It's a full house. Uh, I want to uh, give thanks again to uh, Martin, Safon, and especially Eunice for organizing this event and making it happen. Okay, so uh, across the world, people are coming online with smartphones, smartwatches, and other small, low resource devices. The technology industry needs an internationalization solution for these environments that scales to dozens of programming languages and thousands of human languages. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm, uh, my name's Shane, I'm the chair of the ICU4X uh, subcommittee of the Unicode Consortium, and um, I lead Google's efforts to build these next generation internationalization solutions. I also work a lot with the ECMAScript, um, ECMA 402 standard for the Intel object in JavaScript. So here's my agenda for today. Um, first, I'm going to be give, uh, giving a little introduction about what is internationalization. Then I'm going to be talking about IC4X, going to be focusing on our handling of data management, uh, how we made it modular, other things we learned from building a Rust library, and then give some closing thoughts at the end. So first, uh, internationalization. So internationalization is commonly abbreviated as I18N, which is I followed by 18 letters followed by N. Um, now, a lot of people, when they think about internationalization, they think about, oh, it's about how do you build an app that uh, scales across, uh, across markets and across languages. And that's definitely a big part of it. Uh, I18N is also more than globalization. Um, when I, uh, give this, when I gave this talk in the, in, the, in the United States, a lot of people are surprised that um, a lot of people speak languages other than the national language at home. I know in Switzerland that's, that's fairly common, but like it's, it's, uh, th this is all, all around the world, this, 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 this happens a lot. So um, uh, it's also more than translation. Uh, this here is a light switch uh, in Japan. Uh, is it on or off? I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> uh, IHN is also a very deep problem. Every language, region, and culture uh, has its own unique challenges. Um, and what works for one locale uh, may not work for another. Uh, that's why we have to uh, build um, IATN solutions uh, that are focused on identifying and then solving all of the broad set of problems. Uh, so the uh, the transition from the field of internationalization to what I'm going to be telling you about tonight is the evolving needs for international software. Uh, so um, there's more users in more languages than ever before who are using smaller devices um, with an increased focus on client side and edge computing. Uh, and that's where ICU4X enters the picture. So ICU4X, uh, what is the project? How did it come about? And what are the goals? So. If I had to summarize in just one statement, ICU4X is a modular internationalization library in Rust. What does this mean? ICU uh, stands for International Components for Unicode. ICU for J and ICU for C, for C uh, are industry standards. Um, you may have used libICU before. 
Um, this is a library that has served the internationalization needs for, uh, for over 20 years. Um, there's people also on my team at Google who help to maintain uh, LibICU. Uh, so that's the inspiration for IC4X. Internationalization, I just told you what internationalization is. More concretely, what we're talking about are things like how do you format dates, times, and numbers across regions and languages? How do you do the correct grammatical selection? Uh, at, for example, plurals, um, uh, plural cases. Uh, you have to do Unicode text processing, uh, properties, uh, segmentation, etc., cetera, um, to process Unicode text correctly. Uh, time zones, non-Gregorian calendars, and the list goes on. Modular means that we've, uh, one of our most important goals is modularity. Um, many applications perform internationalization using ICU, uh, but ICU is not built for, uh, foc is not focused on building for small code and low resource uh, environments. So with ICU for X, uh, a very core design goal has been um, how we can design the library so that you only include what you use. A pluggable data, uh, I'm going to be talking about more later, is a big part of that. Um, and it's definitely usable on embedded systems. The 4x part um, is an indication of how ICU for X is designed to not only be used in one language, one programming language, but being, be used across many programming languages. We have a tool called Diplomat uh, that we built for this. Uh, Robert and standing in the back of the room has uh, been a very big, big uh, part of that, as well as Manish, who will be talking after myself. Um, we currently support C++, C, and TypeScript uh, APIs. We're working on more, uh, like Dart and Java, et cetera. Uh, and uh, this allows IC for X to be used in many programming languages, not just Rust. Uh, but we also built in, build in Rust because, as Martin explained before me, it's safe by default, which has a lot of advantages. Um, we can do blazing fast zero copy deserialization, which the talk after mine from Manish will go into much more detail on. Um, and it, again, is appropriate for uh, FFI and using from, use from other programming languages. So the uh, three parts of the key value proposition for IC for X are, again, that we're lightweight, portable, and secure. Okay, so who are we that we that built IC4X? So we are in IC4X is not just a Google project. We are under the Unicode Consortium, partnered with uh, other open source internationalization projects like ICU, uh, in order to build an industry standard library. We're currently a collaboration between Google and Mozilla and Amazon, and we're being developed in the open. And we welcome all contributors. You can go read all of our code on on GitHub. So this here is a quick demo of uh, IC4X in action. This is IC4X compiled to WebAssembly. Um, I'm cl clicking through different screens, showing some different things here. But some things I'll point out are that this is all running locally. Uh, there is no calls to the server happening here uh, at, at all. This is all in WebAssembly locally uh, in my browser. So on the first tab here is fixed is decimal formatting. I can enter a number. I can. This is in the English locale, I can switch it to the Bengali locale. Uh, here's date time formatting. Uh, in English, I can switch the calendar system, I can switch the locale, and you can see the output change. And then here's segmentation of Japanese text. You can see that I can uh, select one word at a time. Cool, so I see for X project status. Right now we're in 2022. Uh, we started the project in 2020. Um, and we've been working on it very hard for two years, and we have our IC4X 1.0 release that we released uh, a couple months ago in September. Uh, so this is all ready to use. You don't have to wait anymore. Uh, yeah, and uh, what, we're going to, what we're working on now and we'll continue to do for the next year um, and beyond is to, you know, uh, is to help integrate with more clients, add additional features, um, and, and so forth. Uh, so it's quite an exciting. It's been an exciting journey, and it's in a very exciting point in the journey. Okay, so now I'm going to dive a little bit more into technical details, because uh, I'm sure that's what you all are here for. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about data management. I'm going to be trying to make an, a uh, point that IC4X is at its core a pipeline for locale data. Uh, so this is one of my favorite charts. 
Um, it's a little confusing uh, when you first see it. But this is a chart of, um, on the x-axis, you have a locales, that's language and language region pairs. And on the y-axis, you have uh, the, amount, the coverage, the amount of uh, data, basically, that are in those locales. So the coverage of the total space of things that can possibly be uh, spec'd out in that language. Um, and then on the third axis, the, three, the third degree axis, if, if you can sort of imagine this being in three degrees, is the CLDR release number. So CLDR is the Common Locale Data Repository, uh, which uh, basically encodes uh, data for how you do date formatting and how you do segmentation for all these different languages. So you can see that in every CLDR release, the amount of data just keeps going up. It doesn't go down keeps growing. In fact, it grows quadratically because you have, because uh, CLDR adds features and it also adds languages. Um, so this is one of the reasons why locale data is challenging. It's big uh, because of the quadratic growth. It's also heterogeneous, meaning every piece of data that you have to process is different. It's also algorithm heavy. Um, we need complex code to process the, uh, the data that we get from CLDR. And all of these reasons are uh, why ICU for X um, is, an important, is a very important piece in order to uh, serve this need. Okay, so we take a multi-pronged approach to dealing with um, locale data and making it fast and efficient. The first is we have no memory allocations, if you can believe it. Uh, once you have your, your data file uh, either loaded from disk or shipped with your uh, executable, uh, we don't have to do anything fancy to read from it. We just read from the uh, binary data directly. Uh, second thing is that we have stable files. This is one of the biggest pain points um, for people trying to use libICU, uh, is that if you have multiple programs that all need to use ICU, they cannot share the same data files because every ICU version needs its own data file. But with ICU for X, uh, we've designed it in such a way that it, we can share data files across, across versions. A third is a pluggable pipeline. Um, everyone and every application has slightly different needs when it comes to how they load and handle their locale data. We have a very customizable pipeline. There's not just a, a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, the fourth is dynamic loading. One of the things that you can do with your data is download it from a, a, for, from a server or from a CDN. Uh, or some other place. And this is the way that we can actually scale to support hundreds and hundreds of languages. Because often what happens is that when you download an app from the App Store, it's like, well, we're only going to support you know, the, top, the top 10 or 20 uh, languages. Um, and that's a problem, uh, especially as you know, we just want to scale software around the world. And we want to make it software accessible to everyone. Uh, that's very limiting. So. Uh, the dynamic loading of data is a really big part of how we can scale uh, to hundreds of languages. Uh, static slicing is, is pretty, pretty fun. This means that when you build your application linking IC for X, uh, we have tools and uh, even automatically, uh, in some cases, uh, you don't have to uh, ship all the data that you need. You only, uh, more data than you need, you only have to ship exactly the data that, that you need. Uh, which is something that ICU uh, for C has not, not been able to do directly. Um, and last, uh, another thing that's, that comes up a lot is live refresh. This means that if you have an app, um, you can download updates to your locale data and deploy those live without having to restart your app, which is kind of cool. OK, the next section of my talk, I'm going to be talking about modularity and how we made ICU for X lightweight. Uh, so how do we do this? Largely by optimizing for tree shaking and code size. So I alluded to this a little bit in my previous slide, uh, that uh, in order to only bring what you use in terms of data, uh, we are able to identify that and at compile time, and this is how we do it. Um, so one component of this is by making smaller crates. Uh, ICU for X, in, instead of just being one large library with all the code in it, uh, we have many smaller pieces, and this makes it more explicit where those dependencies are and where they live. We have smaller functions. This is a very big part of, big, big part of it when you call a function in your code. 
So it's all about the call side from your application into IC4X. What is that API surface that you're that you're calling through? We focus on making those uh, those functions uh, such that they do not have a lot of extra branches of code, and this is what makes tree shaking work very efficiently, meaning that you can avoid large conditional code paths um, and be suitable for dead code elimination. A third uh, little interesting thing that we found when working on code size is that um, we found a lot of code size came from result types, error types that have a lot of extra information stored inside of them. And whenever you do that, you have to also ship the code to construct and destruct those error types. Um, so by making the error types copy, we um, can eliminate a lot of, a lot of bloat uh, and code size. Uh, you can see we are still able to give you the fully detailed error message um, by having a compile time flag. Um, but then in like the release mode, uh, we uh, just have copy error types. And uh, we use traits wisely. Traits are bad because, uh, are, I mean, trait tra 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 objects are great, but they're not so great for, uh, for code size because they don't allow inlining of code. Uh, they carry code even if it's unreachable. For example, if there's a trait that defines 10 functions, if you only use two of the functions, you still have to carry all 10. Um, it often needs to use the heap more often because you can't have trait objects stack allocated. You have to put them somewhere. And V tables in general increase code size and are slow. Um, so we use them when we need to, um, but uh, you know, we try to use um, you know, static types as much as possible. That being said, there are cases where static types actually increase code size relative to trait objects. So it's all a balance. It's, it's all a balance. There's not always a one size fits all solution. Uh, the way that we deal with uh, part of that problem is we can use uh, generic static static types on the API layer, but then uh, call down into uh, a single dedicated low-level function in order to uh, get the benefits of traits without having the uh, code size cost. Um, so static analysis for data slicing, I've uh, alluded to this uh, before. Uh, the way we do this is we annotate functions with their data requirements so that when you call into a function, uh, we can identify what data the function requires. Um, every function that you use has an explicit data provider argument. Um, and uh, then we can run DCE. This here is a little code sample uh, from IC for X. Uh, there's a lot of code here, um, but the most important part is that uh, you call that you invoke this function, you give it a data provider. Uh, the data provider satisfies these bounds these three bounds, and these three are the uh, basically pieces of data that, that you need. We have over, you know, um, we have over a thousand different um, uh, pieces of data in our full data file, including locales, including uh, locales and including um, the data keys. I think there's about 300 data keys. Uh, so in this case, we only need three of them in order to uh, create this time formatter, uh, this thing that can format a, an, an hour and minute second uh, display. We only need these three, uh, and we only need to link those three. I'm um, going to keep moving on. Uh, we use postcard uh, as our way for storing data in a binary form. Postcard is a deserialization crate uh, written by James Munns with small code size and perf as its goals. Uh, this allows us to do the dynamically loaded data where it allows us to, for example, load um, from a server or from the environments, from the operating system. Um, and Postcard allows us to put it in a way that's suitable for that interchange. Deserialization de is normally expensive, but with Postcard, we can uh, do it all uh, in a zero copy fashion. And again, we'll be, um, if you want to learn more about how this works, how we're actually able to do that, uh, uh, stick around for Manisha's talk after mine. Balancing performance. So a big part of IC4X is... Uh, you know, again, we want to make small code, but we also want to have good performance and low memory usage. Often these things go together. Um, for, uh, for example, uh, enabling zero copy deserialization uh, has uh, all of these benefits. It reduces memory and code size, and it increases performance, which is great. Uh, there's also other cases where um, it uh, doesn't always uh, work out that way. 
Uh, for uh, you know, a very easy example to grok for that uh, could be a, a binary search, which is hash table. Like a binary, like if you have um, an array of items and you want to be able to index into them and look them up quickly, uh, it's very small data and small code to use binary search, uh, but it's not as fast. Um, and using a hash table is, uh, you know, a bit more code and data, but it's a lot faster. Um, so that's just a very uh, simple example to illustrate. Uh, in IC Fract, you try to take a holistic view. Um, if there's something that has a big win in one category and a little bit less of regressions in the other, we'll, we'll take it. So we try to balance all of the uh, requirements. Character properties is an example of uh, where we uh, made that, that, that sort of, of choice. Um, we use a, a data structure to store Unicode character properties um, that has very small code and data and um, has fairly fast lookup, but not as fast as, for example, there's over 100,000 characters in Unicode. The fastest way to do it would be to store, uh, you know, one byte per thousand, uh, 10, 100,000 characters and just index into the array. But that's uh, very much more data than you need. So instead, we can compress that down. Um, we lose just a little bit on performance, but we have huge wins on, codes, on, on uh, data size and code size. So uh, I'm going to back up what I said now with, with some numbers because you don't believe anyone who doesn't show you numbers in, 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 in this field. So uh, this here is an example of date time formatting. Um, I compared ICU 72, which is the uh, you know, current stable release of ICU to ICU for X1.0. Um, and this is a performance. Um, uh, these are performance numbers for a, a small micro benchmark that we ran. Uh, ICU for C um, takes uh, a little over, uh, what's that, 400,000 nanoseconds in order to, to run our example. And we broke that down into what's actually happening here. So um, the constructor for the daytime formatter object uh, is, is the red bar. And that's basically the cost in order to load the data that's needed and then parse and process that data. And then the, the yellow part is what's actually running in, in the tight loop. Um, we can also see that on the IC for X columns, uh, the uh, baked, which is on the far right, doesn't have any cost on the, on the there's an extra blue bar. Uh, it doesn't have any cost on that because uh, the baked data um, is an additional way that, that we are able to, to store data that uh, doesn't even require any deserialization at all. Um, but I'll let uh, Manish explain more about that. Um, and then uh, the, the, the two columns in the middle are uh, when we have postcard uh, data. So postcard incurs to just a little bit of cost, but it's still, you know, minuscule compared to what IC4C requires. In addition, these are code size measurements. Um, so IC4C is the blue bar on top, and IC4X is the red bar on the bottom. Uh, this is a code size for a program that prints this number, 1 million and 7, in Bangla digits. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, IC4X, you know, is built and optimized to be able to have a smaller code footprint. And, you know, you can see that it works quite, quite well here. Now, you know, you might be asking, well, is, is this really a fair comparison with, with IC4C, IC4X? Um, to, to, to be fair, uh, I made a first version of this graph in October, and then I'm like, this is not a fair comparison. I actually went into IC4C and like edited the code to try to make it as modular as I could for simple number formatting. And then I updated the graph uh, today before I gave this talk, and I got the, the blue bar down by about 20%, but not more than that. So um, maybe there's still more low-hanging fruit, but you know, I think this is very you know, illustrative of you know, a point that you know, when we first started working on IC4X, I had to make to my management at Google, which is like, why should we start uh, to serve these clients who need small code? Like, why are we starting a new library for them? And it's, it's because of this. It's because, like, when you start a new library from scratch that's designed for modularity and small code size, you can, you know, uh, get, you know, very, very good results um, versus if you, you know, hack on IC4C, which is, you know, it's a great library, it's just not designed for code size. So uh, what are some learnings uh, trying to build um, a library in the REST ecosystem? Uh, one is uh, no stood. Um, we uh, use, uh, so it's because IC4X wants to run on, you know, embedded devices, on Internet of Things devices, 
Uh, we, the whole library, believe it or not, is uh, no std compatible, meaning we don't use any standard library fun functionality. Uh, the way that we're able to achieve this is by abstracting the data storage as much as possible. Um, for example, the files, for example, uh, the data provider, you can store your data on the file system that requires a uh, standard library, obviously, in order to read from the file system. But if you're not using the file system, you don't need STD for that. Um, another uh, part of, you know, no STD enables us to uh, support embedded devices. No STD also is great for WebAssembly and portability. WASM stands for WebAssembly, in case you haven't seen that acronym before. Um, because when you can build IC for X, there's fewer dependencies you need to link, uh, which makes it much easier to build for those environments. Um, now, one thing that I sometimes get asked is uh, we use the alloc module in IC for X, uh, which some people say, well, that's not pure no STD. Uh, my response there is we have thought about this a lot, and um, the, the current clients that we have of IC for X are okay with having an alloc module. If you are a client who needs IC for X without alloc, please open an issue and open a discussion. We, you know, we, we have we have a path forward in order to get to that world as well. Uh, just just let us know. Uh, another thing that I hear a lot when people talk about IC for X is that, well, you have, uh, you know, uh, when I look at at a cargo tree for IC for X, I see like a hundred hundreds of results. Uh, 200, almost 200 lines from the ICU Metacrate, that's a lot of dependencies. Why do you have so many dependencies? And I just want to uh, reiterate that we don't actually have that many dependencies. There's a lot of duplicates. Even in this little screenshot, you can see there's a lot of duplicates uh, from Cargo Tree. And almost all of these are subcomponents of ICU for X and other things that we've built. Um, in order to have better code abstraction. For example, um, most of IC4X is fully safe Rust. There's a few uh, corners of it that require writing small amounts of unsafe code. We've abstracted those into their own crates so that they can be looked at independently, um, which is generally a good style for writing unsafe code in Rust. Um, so that's one thing that causes this, the split here. Um, and there's also a lot here of uh, build time dependencies. Um, so. Uh, TLDR is that small crates are good, but they make dependencies look bigger than they really are. Um, another thing about building a library in Rust is to try to be friendly. Um, try not to panic. In IC for X, we have no implicit panics. We use Clippy to enforce this for us. Clippy has a number of checks that you can enable uh, that can uh, help to make your code panic free. Um, and uh, we also use data driven algorithms. Um, so uh, one thing that uh, comes up a lot when we run data-driven algorithms is that it increases the potential error space because if, for example, someone sends you a uh, postcard file that has data that's not in the shape that you expect it to be, uh, that's a very, very easy way to cause your, your app to crash. Um, and that's not ideal, especially since IC for X is designed to be able to load data dynamically from, you know, uh, from from third party sources, uh, so uh, in order to in order to, to handle this problem, um, we uh, have we uh, we validate the data when it comes in only when it's cheap. But if it's uh, not, then we um, use other mechanisms like warnings and debug assertions and best efforts to handle um, invalid data by handling errors gracefully whenever possible. And uh, yeah, this has been a, a big part of our design, and we've you know, been able to achieve it. So that's great. Okay, so last slide. Uh, key takeaways are that uh, for people in this room watching and people on the live stream later, uh, internationalization consists of a lot of subtle data-driven algorithms, um, which is why you need IC for X uh, to solve all of your i 8 n needs. It solves them in Rust and beyond. And um, it's also possible, and we've demonstrated how, you can build a large library in Rust that is uh, no stood, doesn't panic, and still remains suitable for slicing and other compiler optimizations. Um, so it's been a long journey uh, since 2020, over the last two, almost three years now. Uh, and um, it's really exciting that we have something that you can use, and I encourage you to use it. Um, you can learn more at our website, icu4x.unicode.org. 
uh, you can find us on GitHub, um, et cetera. And you know, I'd love to talk more to you. We, uh, you know, we have the uh, GitHub discussions uh, that we use. Um, that a lot of clients who are like thinking about adopting IC for X post questions on the GitHub discussions uh, tab. That's a great way to get in contact with with the team. Um, and uh, yes, I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk uh, nonstop for the last like 30 minutes or so. So um, thank you all so much for your time and for listening. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Shane about ICU for X? Questions. I like questions. Uh, do you also handle cases like the uh, Japanese light switches that you don't know how to interpret those stuff? That's a good question, yeah. So uh, that's a thing to illustrate that internationalization is an architecture. Internationalization is something that you need to think about when you're building your app. Um, all the way from you know basically ground zero, um, and the Japanese light switches are are to illustrate that that, that point. Um, I don't know if there's currently an IC for X API about light switches. Maybe there will be in the future, um, and so that's why you need to sort of think about building it in at, at the core level. A big part of IC for X is that the functionality that's supported is based on you know what clients have needed and have demonstrated that they needed for you know client side applications. Um, and you know, uh, there's a whole space of functionality that we could add, and maybe will to IC for X at some point in time. Um, so you know, we've uh, you know, in order to ship our 1.0 release, we've focused on building a core set of functionality, and then making that core set of functionality really good. And now that we've done that, uh, we're starting to add more features, and that will you know, it's it's an ongoing, never-ending process. So, question. Yeah, so what were the biggest pain points of using Rust? What are the biggest pain points of using Rust? That's good all good, all good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an acceptable answer. <laughs> that's a good uh, Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. There's, um, you know, others, uh, other people on my team who've been working on, on IC for X, um, you know, uh, might talk about, like, you know, does, uh, does Rust have a big learning curve? And this is a debatable question, like, you know, um, I, I've, I've seen data recently, actually, that's like that says, you know, um, once you get up to speed uh, with Rust, it takes about as long to get up to speed and be productive in, in Rust as it would be to learn some other new programming language. So whenever you learn a new programming language, it's, there, there's always a learning curve involved. Um, um, it's not clear whether or not that's greater in Rust than it is for other languages. In fact, I've seen data that says it's really not. Um, so. That, that that's worked well. I'd, I'd say that you know, um, one of the biggest pain points has been um, like all solvable problems. Like you know, try, trying to interrupt with C plus plus. I think is something that you'll, you'll you'll hear a lot. Like Rust and C plus plus kind of talk to each other, but not completely. And how do you make them talk better with each other? I know there's a whole lot of work in this area, especially at Google. This is something that Google inv is investing a lot in right now. Um, is, is in this, this space of Rust, C++, interop. Um, we've managed to make it work. That's why we have Diplomat. Um, and hopefully, like, you know, now that there's, it's, th this is no lo longer, like, you, you don't have to be a trailblazer anymore if you're trying to do Rust, C++, interop, because there are a lot of good solutions. And, you know, we've done a lot of that work as well. Um, but, yeah, overall, I'm, I'm really happy with, with, with Rust. I'm really glad that we, that we chose that. When we were looking at the project, Early on, we were looking at you know many different programming languages to use. We were looking at C plus plus, C plus plus twenty. Uh, we were looking at starting in something like Java um, to, to to do this. We were looking at other programming languages, and you know at at the time, Rust was was a little bit of, of taking a bet um, that like well if like are we going to go all in on Rust and bet on it? And we ended up doing that, and I think it's worked out really well for us. What's the question, Donna? Good question. Yeah. So. Maybe repeat it for the. Uh, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is, um, I was saying that IC for X has data-driven algorithms. Uh, what does data-driven algorithms really mean? Does it mean we have a lot of machine learning models? Um, can you be more specific there. And what I mean by data-driven algorithms is that, for example, if you need to do a, if you need to format a, a, a number or a date, 
um, the, exact, uh, the exact formula for how you do that is not something that you write in code. It's not something that you actually write in code. It's something that you put in a data file. And we need to be able to load that data file and execute our algorithm uh, based on the data that we found in that data file. Um, so, you know, the, the, the source of the data could be uh, machine learning algorithms. We, we use machine learning, for example, in text segmentation, um, where, we're actually, where we're able to get smaller, faster, better models than if we do it manually. For things like date formatting uh, and number rules and things, those are uh, pieces that are largely, you know, come from, you know, locale experts uh, will create those. So they're not all uh, like trains like machine learning. Some of them come from experts. Some of them are trained from machine learning. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the same problem. You know, when you write a, a machine learning algorithm and you, when you write your convolutional neural network, ultimately it's just code that processes data. It doesn't know anything about what it's doing. It's just sort of a pipeline. And that's, that, that's how I see it. It's, it's all about the pipeline of how you take uh, data, how you push it through some algorithms and get something useful on the other end. And that's ultimately what IC for X is and what many parts of software are really all about. Well, yeah? yeah? What is the relationship between IC to C and X and diplomat? Is it that at the moment you're developing everything, then we say, speedy, fast, compact in Rust first, then you have diplomat, fit out or convert, translate the code also in C++ and start or not the way? That's a good question, yeah. So uh, I see for C is an existing library that, uh, you know, it's been around for 20 years, has, uh, you know, continues to get new features. It's, 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 a fu it's fully alive, uh, I see for C. I see for X, is a new library that solves a new, new different use cases. Um, you know, one thing that I was that I've been very clear about uh, is that um, ICU for X does not seek to replace or displace ICU for C uh, as the general purpose internationalization library. ICU for X is designed for specific use cases. There may be some users of ICU for C who uh, look at IC4X's value propositions and think, well, IC4X is a really good alternative, and that, that, that's great. I don't, ex I don't expect that they'll be necessarily uh, applicable to everyone. For example, IC4C has a, lot of, has a much larger feature coverage. IC4X is um, you know, unlikely to ever reach the full set of features that are available in, in IC4C. That's a really good example. Um, so uh, yeah, now to answer your question about how, like, how do they actually talk to each other? Do IC for C and IC for X actually talk to each other? The answer is that's something that um, I want to look into more uh, in 2023. Are there ways that we can actually share logic between IC for C and IC for X? Right now, they're completely separate projects. Um, they they uh, don't talk to each other except they except a little bit during data generation. Um, but the actual runtime libraries don't talk to each other at all. I would like to change that a little bit. For example, um, we currently use uh, uh, machine learning LSTM models for our uh, text segmentation. I would like to see a world where we don't have to write those twice in C++ and in Rust. I'd like to see a world where uh, some of the more complicated algorithms like calendrical calculations, non-Gregorian calendars, we can write once and use them everywhere. That would be great if we can get to, to that world. I think that this is going to be an evolving process. Um, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? I saw a couple more hands. Uh, I was wondering that, do you feel the lack of some sort of static analysis tool for Rust? Uh, for example, uh, things like making sure that uh, uh, you don't, uh, the compiler does not generate any drop uh, code that uh, takes too much uh, space uh, when you return error. So, so that kind of things is not something that you see when you look at Rust code, but it's something that you only see when you look at the generated code. So. Do you think that uh, it would be nice to have better tools to, to see this, uh, or uh, it was not a big uh, Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, repeat the, I'll repeat the question. I forgot to repeat the previous one. I'll try to remember to repeat the questions. The question was, um, you, we said that for things like a static data slicing and other things, we need to rely on the output of the compiler in order to, uh, you know, uh, perform that type of optimization? Would it be uh, would it be beneficial for us to do more of that at, at source, like w w within the source, so we can actually static analyze the code without having to actually compile it? Yeah. 
Uh, is that summarized pretty well? Cool. Uh, it would be, be nice. It would be great. Uh, it, it would be nice to think about that. One thing is that um, a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, the uh, like we have to analyze pretty much the whole uh, tree of IC for X in order to, to really get the full picture. Um, there's cases where, for example, there's um, uh, you might need to load a particular thing, uh, and that's only valid in certain locales but not others. And in order to uh, see the full picture, we need to basically analyze the whole the, the whole tree uh, of code. So it kind of makes sense to actually let the compiler do this because, like LLVM, a link time optimization is 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 fantastic and it does an absolutely fantastic job at solving this problem. It could be something that we could do maybe at source time. I think source time might make it a little bit more ergonomic, maybe help you debug a little bit better, maybe what's going wrong. Um, yeah, I, I haven't really thought about that. Uh, it, it, it's a good question. I haven't really thought fully about that. Um, sounds like something worth exploring. Um, Was that another question again? I thought I saw one more hand somewhere else, but maybe I answered the question already. How much one? I have a little one. A little one's from Stefan. Yeah, it's this dangerous little one. So uh, <laughs> somebody said you could improve the the memory consumption from the error messages by making them copy. So did, did uh, can you elaborate on that? Oh yeah, the question was, can I elaborate a little bit on uh, copy error messages? Uh, yeah, so um, you know. When you have a function signature and your function returns a result, uh, it's great. Uh, that you know, I think the way that Rust handles errors is is uh, really is, is really good. It makes error handling explicit. Um, you don't have to worry about you know try catch with exceptions, and I think that model is really great. It also means that um, uh, in order to be fully efficient and let the compiler get full optimization, um, if you make your error type basically uh, copy, meaning that it doesn't. It doesn't contain any pointers to heap memory. Uh, it means it can be uh, collected very easily um, in the uh, when you're closing your function. When you when your function gets to the gets to the bottom, it has to destruct all the objects that were created inside of it. And if you can skip uh, destructing errors, um, you know you you're faster and smaller code. Um, so uh, the way that we uh, the thing with errors though is that. Um, like they're useful for for debugging. They're useful information. That's why they exist, right? Uh, so in order to strike that balance, basically in debug mode, uh, we uh, log uh, with log warn the the, the log crate um, the full error message. Um, and uh, in release mode, uh, you can choose to disable that feature, um, and you don't get that. Uh, the, the the you can optimize from the smaller code. That's one thing that I guess I should also point out since. Or maybe some some people are considering uh, playing around with IC for X after this talk. Is uh, I, I'd say one of the biggest pain points I've seen of people adopting IC for X in the last couple of months since we released 1.0 is that we have a lot of features, a lot of cargo features. Uh, so just be mindful. Like if you try to build IC for X and something's not quite building, just make sure you have the right features enabled. I think we have that pretty well documented, but uh, yeah, that's um, just something to, to keep in mind. Once you get all the features straight, then you know, it should all work the way that you expect, so. I wondered about something when I saw these uh, data providers where you had this bound <laughs> with the D that had three different uh, marker traits, right? Or three, three different markers. So I can imagine like if you try to use that data provider wrong, then you get a compiler error, right? You uh, try to get something from it that the data provider doesn't have. And then you add this extra marker and you expand your function signature and then you compile in more code and that's fine. But so, then, what if you stop using that? Uh, yeah. So in your function, the, uh, the the bounds that are on the function are comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, there's not cases that if you use the tooling that we provided to you, that you can end up in a case where you don't have the data that you need. And I think that's one of the big advantages of IC for X's approach versus ICU. For example, in IC for C, you can kind of perform data slicing by running your test suite. And looking at what data was required, and then building a custom data file, and uh, that's how you can build optimized IC for C data files. Uh, but this requires that you basically have a very, very good test suite because there's going to be some locale that you didn't think about uh, that requires Roman numerals in date formats, for example. Uh, 
um, and you didn't include date formatting. Uh, you didn't include Roman numerals in order. And then you, someone you hits that locale, loads your app with that locale, and they crash. Uh, and yeah, so the IC for X uh, signatures basically like you know are comprehensive. But can they be too big? Can you add more and more to the signature over as you develop, and then you refactor the inside of your function, and you don't need all of these times like hours and minutes and seconds? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So we we um we there's a page um on our uh, wiki on our GitHub that that explains uh that that explains how this works. Okay. Uh, the short the short answer is uh you know. While we're developing, we do add and remove things from that signature. It also means that the signature, when we add and remove the data, I'll just skip back to that slide. Uh, it's back here somewhere. All the way back. Where is it? Did I go back too far? Maybe I went back too far. I think I went back too far. Sorry. Uh, this one. Yeah, so uh, you notice that, um, and I think this is maybe something that's a little confusing when you're first using IC for X. It's called try new with length unstable. That's a really weird function name. Uh, why did we call it that? Uh, so try new is a constructor. That's what Rust calls constructors that return results. With length means that this uh, constructor takes one argument in addition to the data provider locale. It takes a length. And unstable means that this list of bounds, these data provider bounds, are subject to change over time. Uh, because you know we continue to evolve our code, so you can add and remove data provider bounds from this function. So the function is unstable. Uh, we do have stable versions of these functions, and you can read more about how we make that work. Um, and there's a whole you know explanation page when you go to IC4X that explains uh, how we actually make that work properly. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 time within the length namespace. This is also a discussion that like, this is one of the bike shed discussions that we had many times when like among IC for X when you're developing. It's like, well, it's really time length. Should we call it three? It, it's an enum. Time is an enumeration. It's an enum that has like five options in it. Uh, it should be called time length, but instead it's actually length colon colon. It's 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 an enum called time in a namespace called length, and you know. We went, we went back and forth a lot being like, well, should we repeat the name of the namespace just so that when you put in your code, it says time length? And yeah, we ended up, uh, this is, uh, we, we ended up re repeating the namespace in some places, but then for, the, for these low level enums, we decided to leave it that way. So uh, yeah, that, that, that is a bit uh, misleading and on this slide. Uh, I think, yeah, I've been up here, for, I, I think I've, I've f fully filled up my time box. So if you have more questions about ic for x please find me. I'm going to stick around, uh, you know, um, get some guacamole after the talk, and uh, you can find and ask me more questions. And, of course, contact on, on GitHub at ic 4 xunicoorg So thank you again. So now we will have a little break until, let's say, half past. Then there's a time to get a little toilet break or grab some chips and guacamole. Also, one thing I'll mention, uh, a lot of people had questions about Diplomat. Um, Rob, <laughs> who is one of the people working on Diplomat, does live in Zurich. So you can annoy him and get him to give another talk in the future. He's, he's somewhere in the back hiding from you. <laughs> also, I fixed the snake game, maybe. <laughs> you can try again. Uh,